dear friends, uh, dear colleagues, um, welcome to today's Facing COVID-19 with PCR video, which is about bringing our patients back uh, in the hospital for cardiovascular procedures, intervention, and surgery. I'm joined today by my colleagues from Bath Hospital London, Steve Edmondson. He is the head of cardiac surgery, and uh, Anthony Mather, interventional cardiologist and director of the uh, service. Now, Bart's Hospital or St. Bartholomew's Hospital uh, has a birthday coming up, 900 years. It has seen the plague, and now we're facing COVID. But of course, we're facing it in a brand new hospital, five years old, uh, with a new infrastructure. We are in difficult times, and we face unprecedented pressures and treatment choices. Weeks ago, we had to focus on restricting access to services because of overwhelming number of COVID-19 patients and the risk of infections. Now, knowing that revascularization, particularly in acute coronary syndromes, as well uh, as valve surgery saves lives, we need to bring back our patients and provide these procedures. Otherwise, we will lose patients to cardiovascular disease. So the provision of cardiac services in the time of COVID requires careful planning. We will talk today about patient pathways to treatment, differences between surgery and interventional cardiology, the patient selection, the role of testing, and the potential role of the heart team. Steve, let me ask let me start by asking you a question about the pathway to cardiac surgery. Uniquely at BART, you never stopped operating throughout the uh, peak of the crisis, and now you start to bring back elective surgery. Andreas, thanks. So we continued as part of a pan-London agreement that these seven cardiac centers would revert to two, the two that were capable of continuing with emergency and urgent cardiac surgery, whilst the other five units were frankly overtaken by providing COVID care. So we maintained a service for emergency and urgent cardiac surgical patients through two hospitals. Now you're bringing back the patients for elective procedures as well. And how does that pathway look? What do you do to make sure that you bring in COVID negative patients, for example? So we learned quickly that we do not wish to operate on patients who are COVID positive because of the outcomes. And we developed very stringent protocols, particularly around screening, to pretty much guarantee that we would not admit COVID positive patients onto our pathways. So I understand that's a pretty involved protocol. Can you just tell us what you what a patient goes through uh, from the listing to the operation um, so you ensure that you really have negative patients there. You're, you're right, it is a, a fairly stringent protocol. Because it was emergency and urgent patient, patients, many of these patients were coming from other hospitals or were in-house. We were therefore able to do part of our screening protocol in the referring hospitals. But it would involve a history indicating no risk, no evidence of COVID. Blood tests looking at inflammatory markers, specifically LDH and ferritin, looking for lymphopenia as another marker of COVID, and COVID swabs. If the COVID swab and those markers were all indicating low chance of COVID infection, we would then do a CT scan. If that was negative, we would then transfer the patient into the hospital, repeat a further upper airway uh, COVID swab, and if that were negative, then we would proceed to surgery. The pathway, of course, is different for our actual emergencies in whom we cannot know in advance the COVID status. And finally, how, how about the elective patients that you bring back? What do you do to test them? So the elective patients, now we, we have slightly modified our protocols. We have delivered just under 200 consecutive patients using that protocol regime without a single patient converting from negative to positive. Uh, we, we are looking now at reducing the intensity of those protocols because they are resource intensive, requires a lot of side rooms to be able to isolate patients, for example. So we're looking at reducing the need for isolation, 
and we were looking at probably not carrying out a CT CAT scan as a routine screening procedure for elective patients. And I know you do swaps. Do you intraoperative swaps for uh, or, or tracheal lavages for these uh, elective patients as well? So what lies behind your question is the incidence of significant incidence, up to 30% of false negative upper airway swabs. That specificity is now improving to 90%. But in the time frame we are talking about, it was a, a risk of a 30% false negative. We would therefore, at the time of intubation for the operation, carry out bronchoalveolar lavage to get a 98% specificity answer. And if that proved to be positive, we would continue to isolate the patient. So you really made sure you know uh, the status at the end of the procedure and you keep the COVID negative patients uh, negative. One more question for us cardiologists, um, really. Um, what makes surgery particularly problematic also in terms of protection for the healthcare workers? So if you think you've admitted COVID negative patients, we were confident that we had. The, the thrust of the protocol is to protect the patient from the staff. We would therefore wear PPE to that effect. So, so if we're assuming we're talking about elective patients who we know as far as we possibly can are COVID negative, then we would now simply wear our normal theatre wear, but with the addition of a surgical mask on top of an FP3 mask if the FP3 mask had a valve whereby one could theoretically um, contaminate the patient. So in fact, for elective patients now, our theatre wear is pretty much what it would be before there ever was COVID. Anthony, in coronary intervention and, and uh, structural intervention, how, how does that surgical risk of exposure differ uh, for, let's say, an interventional day case procedure? Yeah, an intervention, it's slightly different. And this is all to do with the risk of aerosolizing procedures. So our principle for the elective pathway has been keep it simple, keep it quick, and keep it safe. And so for us, um, we use light PPE for all of our cases because we pre-screen them, but only with a questionnaire because we've not had access to community swabbing. And because we're aiming to get these cases all in and out of hospital within a day, the situation is, is quite different to what's happened in surgery. So can you specify, and that's, that's of course of interest, of main interest for, for most of our audience, is now that the acute numbers come down, you have led the development of a pathway for reintroduction of elective coronary and TAVI work. Can you clearly specify what, what we're actually doing? Uh, what do these patients have to go through step by step uh, to come and have, uh, let's say, elective angioplasty? Particularly over the evolution of the pandemic, the heart team has been important in risk stratifying the patients that we think are at risk of an event within the next few weeks, if not months. So the first thing is patient selection. The second is patient consent to let them know what um, the risks were um, moving into hospitals that were dealing with um, COVID patients. Um, the third aspect in the absence of swabbing was two weeks of self-isolation. And that was um, following a very stringent telephone questionnaire that our uh, clinical nurses were able to put in place. And only once we'd identified patients that were prepared to accept the risks that the heart team felt needed a procedure uh, and who'd passed the questionnaire would we bring those patients uh, into hospital. We have retrospectively swabbed them because, of course, that's their first contact with the healthcare professional. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that not a single patient following that protocol has come in with a positive swab, nor in the two weeks after um, have they developed any symptoms of COVID. So we're relatively reassured by that. But of course, we want to be very, very careful still. Let's just narrow this down a bit. Um, what kind of patients did you bring back in the first wave? Um, if I may say, I mean, is everybody on the elective list now coming back into hospital or do you have some cr selection criteria? We took our elective uh, lists in which interventionalists had added patients to the list 
and filtered it. Essentially, the filter was a phone call from one of our doctors to um, understand the patient's current condition. Once we understood their symptomatic condition and we were looking for deteriorating patients um, or for patients that were at high risk of an event, so high ischemic burdens in the context of symptoms, um, or a prognostic disease with respect to left main proximal LAD. All of those patients were then put through a heart team meeting um, in which a decision was made whether to prioritize them or not, based on the potential risks of also uh, picking up COVID. So once we had that list, again, we went back to the patient to let them know that there was an opportunity, but the clear ambition here was to ensure that they had all the facts about their chances of um, having COVID offset against the risks of not performing a procedure. And only once they agreed to that on the telephone did we bring them in on our day case pathway. More of the high risk patients uh, to start with. Did we have to change the hospital setup uh, in surgery, Steve? Uh, did you have to change uh, the rooms or the way uh, people move through the department? We had to have a high dependency on the ability to isolate, to, to put that protocol in place, both in intensive care, so the results of the bronchoalveolar larvae swabs were available, and also on the wards at the time of admission. We feel now we're able to relax that someone, somewhat, and we will certainly have to do that to, to be able to increase our activity as we move into more uh, elective patients. And how, how does that work in cardiology, where we have an influx of emergency patients, uh, Anthony? Do we strictly separate elective from emergent work? Yeah, definitely. For the emergency pathway, we assume everyone is uh, at risk of carrying the virus, unless proven otherwise. And clearly, we don't have um, swabs at the moment that give us a quick enough result. So they're treated in full PPE and put in a different place to the hospital from the elective patients that are coming in, who are all put into their own side room, minimizing staff and other patient contact, as well as going into a dedicated cath lab, which does not see COVID patients. One final word. We wanted to talk about testing, but you already said that we don't overly rely on tests in uh, cardiology. Let's just assume uh, we would have a test available that would rule out COVID infection in, let's say, 45 minutes. Would that change uh, our pathways, do you think, Anthony? So I think for intervention, the approach wouldn't necessarily change the procedure because at the moment we haven't seen from our high risk or acute patients um, a difference in the outcome. And there's an argument that actually fixing the coronaries might well help some of these patients. So therefore, the actual pathway in probably wouldn't change because we're trying to limit the contact to the hospital and keep it safe. But the pathway after might well change because, of course, it means that we then don't have to use side rooms, which are a commodity if the patient tests negative and they can go into an area with other patients who have also tested negative. Could lead to smoother pathways for a majority of patients, I think. Let's, let's finally, let, let's talk a little bit about TAVI. Um, and the question goes to both of you to start with. I mean, TAVI patients are usually elderly and hence at very high risk of a bad course if they catch COVID-19. Um, how do we select and justify getting them into the hospital? Anthony first, and then I'll ask the surgeon on expectations for emergency treatment. So for our elective pathway, I mean, all of the patients listed um, have got critical aortic stenosis. But in order to risk stratify in the current pandemic, um, we define patients who showed signs of deterioration. Um, and that's still at home, but whose symptoms were getting worse. So again, it was a telephone call and a very similar procedure to intervention to make sure they had no symptoms. Steve, what happens if uh, we ha we run into trouble with uh, with TAVI patients? Would you still be able to do emergency surgery here? There was talk that there would be limited access. Just important to say that in those just on the 200 patients that have been emergency and urgent, um, by using the protocols we have, we've delivered the same outcomes as we would expect in a non-COVID era, i.e. a mortality of less than 2%. 
And it's therefore informed with an extension from that. If you feel you can offer COVID protected, COVID free pathways, that you should be making your decisions on prioritization, the patient you accept, purely on the cardiac risk to the patient and not the additional COVID risk. The issue comes that if a patient were to say undergo TAVI or indeed cardiac surgery and develop COVID, they would then be treated from an intensive care perspective as COVID been the primary problem. And therefore the criteria the anesthetist would use uh, would be potentially different uh, than would otherwise be the case. For example, if a patient got into difficulties after a cardiac procedure, whether that was TAVI or surgical AVR, and needed reventilation at four or five days post-op, that would happen. If that patient developed COVID, the reason whether they would be ventilated or not would depend on the COVID prognosis. And you would get some patients potentially who would not get reventilated because of their COVID prognosis rather than cardiac. So when you're discussing with patients whether they're going to come in for procedures, that aspect, uh, and it will be a very low frequency, but that aspect of their care does need to be stressed to them because they are not going to be following the previously uh, expected cardiac pathways. Okay, well, given the fact that we bring negative patients in, I think we'll just, uh, we're reassured that they will get the usual backup. So finally, Two questions I have. If we're now trying to get elective patients back and we're thinking we can select uh, COVID negative patients, would we work without any further protection uh, in these cases because it's back to normal? Or do we have a new way of protecting ourselves uh, and the patients uh, since the pandemic? Anthony, in the cath labs, for elective patients, what do we do? I think for the minute, no. We, for the minute, we still wear face masks and eye protection. And that time will tell how um, sensible, sensitive and accurate these tests are in protecting both staff and patients. But clearly, if we do get tests that have 100% predictive value, and we can also be clear that our staff aren't giving it to patients, then we can probably revert back to how it used to be. Steve, what do you do in theatres? Just for colleagues to understand that wearing full PP and doing cardiac surgery is not too onerous. Of those 200 mm-hmm. patients, there were 20 odd aortic dissections, emergencies where we wear full yeah. PP, including a visor, and it is not too onerous. When you know you're COVID negative, as far as you possibly can be, the danger is the st- are the staff infecting the patient. Therefore, all we add on is a surgical face mask to the FP3 mask we would normally be wearing if that FP3 mask has a valve. So essentially, it's normal theatre wear for uh, doing elective cardiac surgery. I have one more question uh, for both of you, and that uh, regards the heart team. Is there a role for the heart team? I think there is. But the question really is, should we lean towards intervention now um, that we can do day case intervention versus uh, involved cardiac surgery in patients uh, where there is a choice um, or are we back to pre-pandemic decision making? I think we've always offered that opportunity for patients that have equipoise between surgery and PCR, particularly with the risks of COVID patients uh, who retrospectively we discover are positive going on to uh, ventilators. I think the question now becomes capacity. I think every hospital is down on its capacity. And what we now need to do is manage all of our patients, perhaps in the cohort through the heart team, to understand the quickest way of providing effective revascularization. For elective patients, COVID-free, we should treat the patients according to their cardiac prognosis. And absolutely, there should be a heart team decision based on the cardiac outlook and cardiac prognosis. When you move to emergencies, it is potentially a different matter and you might consider a less invasive intervention. And certainly if the patient is known COVID positive, we would be very low to offer cardiac surgery knowing that. And in those circumstances, then a lesser intervention, not involving cardiopulmonary bypass and the inflammatory hit the patient will get from that to add to their COVID inflammation 
could be the way forward. So certainly in the emergency situation, we would be more in favor of percutaneous intervention. Thanks. And I think that's what we're, we're practicing. Well, we've come, we've come to the end of, uh, of this. Thanks both for this informative uh, discussion. I think the take home messages uh, are clear. We have well-established pathways to, the, to reintroduce elective procedures. They require good planning. They require some change in the hospital infrastructure, not the building, but the pathways. Careful patient selection, screening and testing according to the principle that you want the highest chance of accurate uh, results, and an ongoing heart team activity and communication between the disciplines to provide the best outcome. So thanks again to our colleagues from BARTS. Before we close, let me point out that there is now a wealth of additional information on the website here at PCR Online, Facing COVID-19 with PCR. And I invite you to look at the other spotlights dealing with specific problems around the pandemic. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.